if we lose the world's largest producer of resources and then the world's largest producer of labor, think about the inflation costs. Ladies and gentlemen, we are at the precipice and probably the closest we have been to World War III in a very, very long time. Unfortunately, it continues to get worse. We're going to be talking about the situation that is in Russia. How did we get here and how it's going to impact all of us in Canada and the United States moving forward? So if we look at today's news release, you guys, very, very not good and very chilling. President Putin did a two-hour address. I watched it. Made me think of the Cold War all over again and he's pulling back from the last remaining nuclear arm pact with the United States. So the president is suspending his country's participation in the new START nuclear arms reduction treaty in the United States. Now this is where each country is allowed to inspect each other's nuclear armaments. So the United States would send some of its personnel over to Russia. They would inspect all of their nuclear arms and count them up to make sure that they are not building too many or they're not taking have way too many and that both countries are even remember during the cold war they were trying to match each other and outdo each other and they were building so much up to the point where they could have destroyed the world many times over how scary is that so he is now pulling out of it he's suspending it but it is reversible now the u.s of course what are they saying deeply unfortunate and irresponsible russia says it's not going to comply with its obligation to allow inspectors into its own territory so they are going to leave for themselves their possibility of making sure that they can grow their armaments if they need remember we're we're not getting a lot of information from Russia, but what we are getting is from the United States and Europe, who's providing Ukraine with the weapons that they are using them up faster than they could be made, even though they're trying to ramp up production. What do you think is happening on the Russian side? Now, let's get into some of this story today, because this is just the tip of the iceberg to me. So if I go and look at the picture of Russia that is as a whole, that was USSR back in the day. Of course, Putin is remembering their glory days before they actually collapsed financially. We could see that they owned Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, all on the eastern side, Belarus, Ukraine, Moldova. But it wasn't just for no reason. Over on this side, there's mountain ranges along these sides that make it very, very easy to defend for Russia instead of where the border is right here it's just a flat piece of land you could drive a tank across any of this border that you want but remember this is crimea down here that is mostly russian speaking and a couple of the little donbasses over here right touching russia and these two little provinces here but it was very easy for them to protect here if we look over here you know the caspian sea and other mountain ranges here it was easy to protect from a military standpoint but it's not easy to control that amount of land remember the resources that you need to run this amount of land with all the roads and infrastructure is what drained them back in those days so they've been beaten back into a much smaller area but now it is much harder to defend against. Now, we're going to have to continue on down that path a little bit because a lot of this stems from when the USSR was around. Remember, when the USSR was around, there were Russian speakers moving into every other territory. As the closer you are to the border, the more there is. Remember, Quebec and Ontario are touching each other. And in the eastern Canada where I am, my family lived right near the border. And as you cross into the border of Ontario, Ontario, now it's an English-speaking province, there was a lot of French people in the towns that are right near the border. But this is natural after a hundred years of people speaking both language crossing that border. But the farther you leave that border, the less there is. So it's not a real big surprise that these provinces had a lot of Russian speakers because imagine back in the day, you may have been there for generations and then all of a sudden new border was drawn. So there's a lot of Russian people that were there. Remember, I don't like to talk about politics. I want people to be safe, people to trade, for people to build businesses and be healthy and happy. But we can't be naive enough to believe 
believe that everything is just one shade. And so whatever you see in the news, wherever you see it, I encourage you to please jump in and do a little bit more research on the subject. I don't want anyone to die. I think war is a terrible waste of life. But if we go back and look in Ukraine, Ukraine's problems go way back even to when they separated. Just go and look up on Wikipedia. Ukraine has faced a series of politicians, criminal bosses, oligarchs, corruption of the police, political parties, the corruption of industry. And look at the history, man. I mean, if you go into this, the bribery, the political corruption is here. Judicial corruptions in the public sectors. This goes on and on and on. So Ukraine is no shining night is what I'm trying to say. Ukraine has had its problems going way, way back. If you go check out these articles in 2015, welcome to Ukraine, the most corrupt nation in Europe. And it goes in to talk about all the problems that are going on in Ukraine. And this is long before the war actually broke out. Ukraine has been and will be an ongoing, very, very corrupt country. I need you to have a little bit of context as well, is that my own family on my mom's side, they're Ukrainian. My father on my dad's side, so my grandfather, he was born in Odessa. Why did both of my sides of my family come from Ukraine? On my dad's side, these are old types of money. These old types of money are German. Why does this mean anything? This right here is the controlling of the money as the currency collapsed in Germany. His family had to run away from Germany and try to save themselves. This money is called emergency money. The problem with emergency money in the day is if you read on the back and you translated it, you could see clearly there's a date on the back, which means that that money expired. Big problem. Number two, it also has the city. So it says you cannot spend this money outside of the city. Problem one. So now you can't even leave with your money and spend money anywhere else. Number two, it expires. As you see the date on the back, 1920, December 31st. That's another problem. If you don't spend it by the time that you need to, then you're going to be in trouble as well. So location and time. And now the third one was it's only good for certain types of purchases, like paying your taxes at the city or, or something like that. This is kind of the problem that we're running into today with our central bank digital currency. I did a whole video on that. I'll link it up above for you to take a look at that one on central bank digital currency. This is the exact same type of money. And so that breakdown of the currency is why they had to run. And he was born in Odessa, which is now Ukraine, but at the time was USSR. So you can see how these problems can go back in time. Now, we already know that Ukraine was a very, very corrupt country, but we have to take a look at the Minsk agreements. And so the Minsk agreements were a series of international agreements that were sought to end the Donbass war. Now, no one has ever heard of the Donbass, right? Until this war has just broken out to end the Donbass war fought between armed Russian separatist groups and armed forces of Ukraine. So you guys were going to jump back and say, holy man, you guys, I can't even believe this. The war, we all thought, only started a year ago. Little did you know that this war has been going on for almost a decade, fighting back and forth between the majority Russians who were living in the Donbass, fighting back and forth. And so this has killed 14,000 people. And the majority of people in Canada and the United States had never even heard of this. Yet thousands of people are dying in this altercation for those couple of states that are just near the Russian border and Crimea, as we know, got annexed before. So this has been coming for a long, long time. As you can see here in 2014, there was an agreement, then it broke apart. There was another one in 2015, which was Minsk II, and it was to establish that buffer zone. And you could see this in the map on the side here when they're going to have the Donbass area. And I think that this is very, very important for us to know the amount of death that has happened and that this fight has been going on for a long, long time. Here is my two cents on it at the end of the day. I don't want to ever be political, but I want everyone to be happy and healthy. There is no winning. What do I mean by that is I saw video of England after the Second World War where every building had been bombed, just piles of rubble. Everyone is hurt. Everyone has lost family members and they're saying we won. You look around and say we're all starving every building is broken now i know the alternative would have been worse my point is is that everybody loses in a war everybody so both sides are going to be hurt and so even though a couple of people at the top make those decisions hundreds of thousands of people have to die 
and millions of families will lose a member and it is terrible all around. So we would hate to see that. Here is something that I want to show you. If we look at Canada, the M2 money supply, we had another massive, let's call it war. And that war was during the lockdowns in the past couple of years. If you could see from 2020 onward, there was an insane amount of money that was needed to pay people. So when they did that, they're causing massive inflation. If we're going to go look at the United States, we can also see where it goes absolutely straight vertical, like it was bouncing off of a trampoline or something. Let's just look at it again, like straight up. Now, where we are at the peak here, it's only come off a tiny little bit, and that's what everyone is freaking out about. My point is, at the end of the day, when there is a second world war that we had, when there is a pandemic, when there's a great financial crisis, insane amounts of money are printed and we have to now pay that inflation tax for decades. So as this is happening, there's going to be more and more and more problems that are going to be moving forward. Now, I took a picture here that I wanted to show you. This is just showing you the green tech processing that is moving forward. The red is the one that you have to pay attention to. The red is the stuff, if you see on the side, that is made in China and Russia majority. So you can see there's graphite, titanium, silicon, solar panels, aluminum, rare earth. They're all majority red. Now, all of those reds are all coming out of Russia and China. So in addition to us having to pay a massive like war tax that is coming, if Russia stops creating all of those materials and stops sending it to the West, in addition, China now wants to arm Russia, maybe, maybe not. If we lose the world's largest producer of resources and then the world's largest producer of labor, think about the inflation costs. We can't just open up an aluminum mine tomorrow. It could take a decade for that. So when we're talking about the biggest purchase in the majority of people's lives, which is real estate, think of the metals that go into it, the copper wiring, the pipes. We have to look into aluminum wiring in some cases or aluminum siding, or you have the asphalt shingles or the glass and aluminum windows that go into it and the cement that is required and everything that goes into making that. We need that stuff to continue building. If we have to wait 10 years to build a mine here, think of the inflation that's going to happen and the increase in cost. Insane. Think of that downward effect, right? And so, yes, inflation is going to hurt us, but the cost in human life is going to be much, much worse. I wish people were smarter and remembered more our history. And these emergency monies to me, I keep on my desk because it's a terrible reminder of the world that my grandfather had to run from. And I pray it's not going to run through any of us. We all have to be safe out there, but we also have to watch for our own selves, our own families. That is our responsibility. So being in touch with what is happening in the world is important. You may not have the power to change it. I know I certainly don't, but we also have to prepare ourselves for a future that is going to be quite a bit more rocky. All I can see is a lot of inflation coming in the future. I think there's going to be a lot of it. And that inflation, I expect at least 10% for the next five years. That's why I think everybody should be holding a little bit of the most international currency over the millennia is gold. Everyone should have a little bit of gold and a little bit of silver in your portfolio. Anyway, you guys, I'm really, really hoping that everybody stays safe. And let's hope that this does not escalate because we all got to be safe and take care of our families. Have a good day, everyone.